Hi, my name is Dr. Rochelle Andriotti, and I'm going to be talking to you today about sonography of the normal female pelvis. Uh, my only uh, financial relationship is that I have been a speaker for a Philips Healthcare user course. So what are our objectives? Uh, first, after completing this presentation, uh, you will recognize the normal sonographic appearance of the non-gravid female genital tract. You'll recognize the sonographic appearance of the female pelvis with respect to the normal menstrual cycle. And you'll become aware of newer sonographic techniques and other modalities for imaging the female pelvis. So pelvic sonography is the imaging modality of choice for evaluating the female pelvis. So we're going to be reviewing pelvic sonographic anatomy, which forms the framework to be used to evaluate the abnormal pelvis. So during this lecture, we will review sonographic technique, the normal pelvic anatomy, pelvic hormonal changes during the menstrual cycle and with menopause, and other sonographic techniques and modalities used to image the female pelvis. So the standard pelvic examination is composed of transabdominal imaging as well as transvaginal sonography. The diagnostic information offered by the two approaches is, in many cases, complementary. Color Doppler sonography may also be added to either study to enhance diagnostic capabilities. So here we have a uh, image uh, showing the uh, transabdominal probe and how it's placed on the abdomen uh, and we can see the pelvic organs beneath it that we are imaging. So with transabdominal sonography we use a distended bladder as a window to pelvic structures for a global view but visualization is limited by attenuation from the body wall and the distance from the area of interest of the transducer. So we are resultingly unable to use higher frequency transducers and benefit from their inherent higher axial and lateral resolution as we will with transvaginal imaging. So here we have our typical image uh, transabdominally showing the distended bladder with the uterus uh, behind the bladder. And then in our transverse image, once again, the uterus, and we can see the ovaries on either side of the uterus. So a limited transabdominal technique may also be used to complement transvaginal sonography. And this would be an initial evaluation using transabdominal sonography without dedicated bladder filling which has been found to be very useful to see a global view of the pelvis before performing a more detailed transvaginal examination. So moving on to transvaginal sonography, we can see a drawing of the transvaginal probe in the vagina with the organs above the transvaginal probe that we will be imaging, uterus and ovary, and then here is the bladder. So transvaginal sonography gives a more detailed evaluation of pelvic architecture using higher frequently frequency transducers, usually greater than 5 megahertz, at closer proximity to pelvic structures, but the field of view is limited. This technique uh, also involves certain contraindications. First, we would not perform the study in premenarchal patients, in the majority of virginal patients, and in any patient who does not willingly consent to the vaginal examination. We can see here the image when we place the probe within the vagina. We can see a sagittal view of the uterus, uh, cephalad on this side, posterior below the uterus, anterior above the uterus, and in the transverse view, which is actually the coronal view of the pelvis, once again, right is on this side, left is on the 
on this side, as we would see imaging with any modality, anterior usually on top, posterior below, as long as the uterus is uh, has its fundus pointing anteriorly. And we will discuss this uh, particular uh, problem um, later in the talk. So how is the transvaginal image then uh, seen um, and, um, with respect to the transabdominal image? So the uterine axis is rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise from the transabdominal image on the sagittal view. So here we would have the transabdominal image. And if we rotate this um, the way this yellow arrow is pointed, 90 degrees, we would have the position of the uterus that we see on the transvaginal image. But the uterine orientation on the transverse view, which is the coronal view of the pelvis, is usually the same as the transabdominal image, as we can see here. So let's look at the normal sonographic appearance of the non-gravid genital tract. So once again, our typical transabdominal image, bladder anterior, uterus in the sagittal plane, and we have uh, the uterus seen posterior to the distended bladder, as I just mentioned, and anterior to the rectum and sigmoid back here, which is seen only as dirty shadowing due to the gaseous uh, contents of the bowel. We could also see that behind the uterus in the transverse plane. And once again, we can see the ovaries on either side with little tiny follicles that helped us, us to, uh, to know that these are truly the ovaries. Then uh, we can also use um, ultrasound to look at the pelvic floor and see the normal anatomy of the pelvic floor with the uh, relationship of the urethra, vagina, and rectum here in the sagittal plane with the urethra, the vagina, and the, and the rectum. And then here we can even see the uh, relationships in the coronal planes by doing a transperineal evaluation um, of the pelvic floor. And here in the coronal plane, we can see the uh, relationship of the urethra, vagina, and the rectum. So let's move on to pelvic vasculature. Um, first, uh, we will we're mainly talking about the uterine and ovarian arteries. The uterine artery is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery running medially on the levator ani muscle to the cervix. The uterine artery then ascends along the lateral aspect uh, of the uterus in the broad ligament to the level of the uterine cornu right here where its ovarian branch courses laterally in the utero-ovarian ligament. Uh, the ovarian artery is a branch of the hypogastric artery, which out here, uh, and the ovarian uh, branch of the uterine artery over here then can uh, meet uh, within the utero-ovarian ligament right in here, providing the pampiniform plexus of vessels uh, which perfuse the ovary right in here. So here's a sonographic uh, transvaginal image uh, showing these vessels, the uterine artery along uh, the side of the, uh, the uterus, uh, the ovarian artery coming from the region of the sidewall meeting here, uh, better depicted in this image, where we see these vessels form the pampiniform plexus that feeds the ovary. And then uh, the uterine artery also provides branches which pierce the myometrium, as we can see here, um, and uh, then divide into anterior and posterior arcuate arteries. Um, and from these arcuate arteries arise branches which penetrate deeply into the myometrium 
forming radial arteries. So the radial arteries in here, the deepest arteries, and the arcuate artery, which runs along this area right in here. So moving on, let's talk about the uterus. This consists of the cervix, the lower cylindrical portion, which projects into the vagina, the body or corpus, and the isthmus, which is the narrow area connecting the body and the cervix, which in pregnant patients is often referred to as the lower uterine segment. So here we have the cervix, which is anchored at the angle of the bladder, right in here, uh, the long arrow, um, by parametrial structures and forms a 90 degree angle with the vagina. So here we can see this yellow line forming the 90 degree angle of the vagina and the cervix. Uh, we also um, can normally see a little bit of fluid within the cervical canal and also this fluid is outlining the exocervix, so we can see it very nicely in this image. And this usually represents cervical mucus, a normal finding. Also within the cervix, we may also see little cysts called nebothian cysts. These are a result of occlusion of endocervical glands and generally have no clinical significance. So moving on, we'll talk about the uterine size and its consistency, its position, and the endometrium. So the measurement of the uterus may be performed by transabdominal or transvaginal sonography in the sagittal, transverse, and anterior, posterior dimensions. And the uterine length is often measured more accurately by the transabdominal approach, since the cervix may not be completely included on the transvaginal image. For example, here we can see a transabdominal image where we can measure the uterus from the bottom of the cervix very clearly to the top of the uterus. Whereas on the transvaginal image of the same patient, we can see that the cervix is not completely included in the image. So uh, one would need to be very careful in pulling the probe out enough to include the cervix in order for the transvaginal image to be the appropriate image to use uh, for this measurement. And also uh, transvaginal imaging um, would definitely be the imaging method of choice to look at the uh, uterine architecture, uh, where we can um, more clearly see this uh, due to uh, the closeness of the probe to what we're looking at, as well as the higher frequency transducer, which gives us better resolution. So a little more about the myometrium itself. It's divided into an echogenic outer layer, which we can see out here, which is bounded by the arcuate artery medially. Um, then the intermediate layer, uh, which we see here, M, uh, and then the hypoechoic inner layer, which is just a thin hypoechoic band surrounding the endometrium itself. Actually, this is usually not that well visualized on sagittal and transverse views, but if we perform a 3D reconstruction of the uterus to obtain a coronal view, uh, the inner layer appears very clearly as a thin hypoechoic halo surrounding the endometrium. So what are the uterine measurements? In the uh, premenstrual patient, the pediatric patient, the average volume is approximately one cubic centimeter up to about age nine. And the cervix is often seen to be larger than the corpus. So you can see here, remember in these patients, we only have transabdominal imaging and we can see the very small uterus um, behind a very distended bladder. Uh, and we can see here that the cervix appears to be quite large compared to the corpus. Uh, 
So what about the normal measurements in patients who are in the menstruating age group? Now these will vary with parity. They range from about 6 to 10.5 centimeters in length, 3 to 6 centimeters in transverse diameter, and 2 to 5 centimeters in AP diameter. And then the normal measurements in postmenopausal females, a bit smaller, uh, 3.5 to 7.5 centimeters in length, 2 to 4 centimeters in transverse uh, diameter, and 1.7 to 3.3 centimeters in uh, in AP diameter. So uh, to compare uh, the uterus in the menstruating age group and the postmenopausal age group, um, I'm showing you these um, images where we have the menstruating age group patient. The uterus measures about seven centimeters in length. And you can see that the uh, measurements of the postmenopausal uterus are considerably smaller and visually um, look a bit smaller than the menstruating age group um, uterus. Um, also, another thing to note is that once again, when a patient becomes postmenopausal, the cervix becomes larger again with respect to the corpus of the uterus. Cervix, corpus. So what about uterine position? Um, this actually can be variable and changes with the degree of bladder and rectal distension. We talk about flexion, which is the axis of the uterine body relative to the cervix, and version, which is the axis of the cervix relative to the vagina. Uh, for example, here we have an antiverted, antiflexed uterus, the most common position where the cervix is uh, anterior with respect to the vagina and the corpus is anterior, is pointing anteriorly with respect to the cervix, and the same is seen on the transvaginal image. Uh, an example of a retroverted, retroflexed uterus, um, the uh, cervix posterior with respect to the vagina, and the corpus pointing posteriorly with respect to the cervix. And just uh, one thing that I want to remind you that could be a problem when we image a retroverted uterus, we need to remember that the beam is actually um, hitting the posterior portion of the uterus before um, the anterior portion. So on the transverse view, what's on top is not the anterior portion of the uterus, but the posterior uterus. Um, and this could be confusing if you don't think about it um, on your image. And then we have the neutral position uterus, um, which uh, demonstrates uh, a coronal rather than a transverse view of the uterus when we move our transducer um, from sagittal and rotate it 90 degrees to the coronal plane. So since there is no uh, flexion or version, we are actually then cutting through and slicing through the uterus completely in the coronal plane, and there's no transverse plane, as we can see in this image. And then moving on to the endometrium. First, the endometrial cavity is seen as a thin echogenic line, a specular reflection of the opposing endometrial interfaces, as we can see here. Uh, and the endometrium is composed of the superficial functional layer that sheds with menses, and then a deep basal layer, which we can see on either side of the endometrial cavity. So the measurement of the endometrial thickness uh, should include the double layer thickness uh, anterior and posterior to the uh, endometrial canal. The measurement should be performed in the sagittal plane with the endometrium perpendicular to the direction of the beam for best accuracy. And the uh, hyperechoic 
halo that we talked about, which is actually the inner layer of the uh, myometrium, should not be included in this measurement. So here we can see in this endometrium, since it's completely echogenic, it is very easy to place our calipers on either side of what we call the endometrial echo. So how sh thick should the endometrial echo be, or the patient's endometrium? Um, according to past reports, this should not exceed more than about 14 to 16 millimeters. So here we can see the very thin echogenic line at the time of menstruation. Uh, the proliferative endometrium in the uh, first uh, phase of the menstrual cycle, which is predominantly hypoechoic around the cavity, and the secretory endometrium, which is the endometrium um, that fills in with echoes following ovulation, which we'll talk about in a little more detail soon. So what about the postmenopausal endometrium? This is commonly atrophic with a thickness measuring less than 4 to 5 millimeters with a mean of about 3.4 millimeters. Vaginal bleeding in these patients is often secondary to just atrophy, the lining being so thin. And uh, if these patients have bleeding um, and it's less than or equal to 4 millimeters in thickness, um, there is a very, very small chance of endometrial cancer. It's been reported to be about 1 in 917. So if a patient is asymptomatic then, is not bleeding, what is, is there any um, significance to endometrial thickening? Um, actually, uh, thickening of the endometrium without um, symptoms um, is highly debatable. There are no prospective studies performed to determine the significance of, uh, of thickness. And what seems to be more important is the texture of the endometrial echo. Does it look like a polyp? Does it look like a fibroid? So routine biopsy really, no matter what the thickness of the endometrium is in a patient who is not bleeding, is not routinely recommended. So here is an example of a typical appearance of the postmenopausal endometrium, which is extremely thin, like uh, we said, usually less than about five millimeters. So moving on to ovaries. These are ellipsoid structures and be, can be identified in menstruating females by the presence of follicles. Um, the location of the ovaries is variable. It's often seen in the ovarian fossa, which may be called Waldeyer's fossa, especially in nulliparous patients, it may be seen in this area. And Waldeyer's fossa is bounded by the obliterated umbilical artery anteriorly, the ureter and internal iliac artery posteriorly, and the external iliac vein superiorly. So here uh, we have a nice um, sonographic depiction of Waldeyer's fossa bounded, here's the ovary, which is bounded posteriorly by the internal iliac artery and uh, superiorly by the external iliac vein. So what about the size of ovaries? Um, it was once mentioned by Dr. Harris Cohen that the ovaries are bigger than we think. So in patients who are in the menstruating age group. The mean volume is about 9.8 cc's, but it has a very large range, as you can see, up to about 21.9 cc's. In the premenarchal patient, um, the mean volume is about 3 cc's, with also a pretty large range, up to about 9 cc's. And in the postmenopausal female, the uh, mean volume is about 5.8 cc's, with uh, a range of about, uh, from about 1.2 to 14.9 cc's. So once again, an example, transabdominal images in the premenarchal patient showing very small ovaries 
with a mean volume of about 0.7 and 0.5 centimeters for right and left ovary. Then in the uh, menstruating age group, we see more developing follicles in different stages of maturity. And of course, once again, this helps us to identify the ovaries. So here are the ovaries with little tiny follicles. And then we have postmenopausal females. Uh, so once late postmenopause is reached, and late postmenopause is considered greater than five years since the final menstrual period, at this point, follicular genesis ceases, the ovary atrophies, and the follicles disappear with the ovary decreasing in size. Um, so it may really be difficult to visualize these ovaries sonographically. So here we see a more homogeneous appearing ovary in sagittal and transverse views. And what you can really note here is that follicles are not present. And this would be a patient in the late postmenopause. So one more thing we should just mention are the fallopian tubes. These are musculomembranous structures measuring approximately 12 centimeters in length. This is not a routine part of the normal examination to actually look for the fallopian tubes, but we can often demonstrate at least a portion of each tube in the majority of patients if we try. So here we have the normal fallopian tube, the uh, intramural uh, uh, portion of the tube, which is often called the interstitial portion. Uh, within the coronal area, the isthmic portion of the tube, and the ampullary portion of the tube distally. Um, the fallopian tube sonographically can be identified by its tubular structure, as we see here, and often we may see a little line with, that represents the lumen of the tube. Um, and this uh, tubular structure can be followed to the uterine coronal right here. Also, another thing we may look for in the normal patient is if there is anything in the cul-de-sac. And what we do see in these patients often is a very small amount of fluid. Um, normal physiologic fluid is usually considered fluid which is no more than about 15 mLs. Or uh, we definitely would not want to see a normal amount of, it would not be a normal amount of fluid if uh, it traverses um, higher than the fundus of the uterus, which would be up here. So now let's move on to look at sonographic changes in the appearance of the female pelvis with respect to the menstrual cycle and with age. So here we can see what happens hormonally in the patient who is uh, of the menstruating age group and is having normal ovulatory cycles where we have the gonadotropin surge at mid-cycle with fluctuations in estrogen and after this um, mid-cycle surge then we see the production of progesterone in the second part of the menstrual cycle as opposed to patients who are perimenopausal and have unopposed estrogen stimulation without um, uh, ovulation, um, and then we move on to the truly postmenopausal female who no longer has much estrogen being produced by the ovaries, but does, um, because of that, has a very high level of gonadotropins being produced by the pituitary gland. So because of these changes in hormones, we see differences um, sonographically as far as the uterus and ovaries. First, let's look at cyclic changes of the ovaries. Within the follicular phase, under the influence of follicle stimulating hormone, multiple immature less than one centimeter follicles are seen in the early follicular phase before day 10. So there's enlargement of ovarian follicles with, with usually one dominant preovulatory follicle, which averages about 20 millimeters prior to ovulation. So here we can see these multiple developing follicles within the early follicular phase. 
and then one or two dominant follicles are usually seen after day 10 and these would measure more than about one centimeter with the other smaller follicles beginning to involute and become even smaller. And then here we have the ovulatory follicle which usually measures between 18 and 25 millimeters. And within this ovulatory follicle, often around 24 hours prior to ovulation, we may see a smaller cystic structure uh, called a cumulus oophorus. And this is a structure that's formed by the separation of the granulosal layer of the follicular wall from the fecal layer uh, containing the ovum. Then we move on to the luteal phase. Following the LH surge, uh, which triggers ovulation, um, a uh, the follicle will then rupture and becomes the post-ovulatory corpus luteum. This is a crenulated, thick-walled cystic structure that also demonstrates peripheral vascularity by color Doppler. So as we can see here, the thick-walled cystic structure with the irregular inner margin and peripheral color Doppler flow, the post-ovulatory corpus luteum. And then the premenstrual corpus luteum will form, um, and this will fill in with echogenic material, uh, predominantly blood, um, and no longer appears cystic. So at this point, the, often the only way to determine that's even present in the ovary is by the peripheral color Doppler flow that is seen around the structure. So we can also perform follicle evaluations in which we monitor the size and number of follicles to evaluate for ovulation in patients just with normal cycles, with uh, ovulation induction cycles, or with IVF cycles. Um, and in these patients, we try to determine if there is a mature uh, follicle uh, that is um, available for ovulation. So let's move on now to cyclic changes of the endometrium. And this includes the menstrual phase, the proliferative phase, and the secretory phase. And there are variations in thickness and architecture throughout these phases that have been well described in the literature. In the menstrual phase, there's a thin, slightly irregular echogenic surface, as we can see here, due to sloughing of the functional layer of the endometrium. Then we move on to the proliferative phase, where there's thickening uh, with an echogenic border, as we can see here and here. Uh, and this, uh, uh, but uh, we see a hypoechoic inner layer reflecting increase in the length of glands. So the hypoechoic layer here represents the increase in the length of glands um, due to um, the est estrogen stimulation. Uh, and uh, we still can see the peripheral endometrial myometrial junction and the linear echo in the center that represents the cavity. Then we move on to the secretory phase, where there is increase in echogenicity of the endometrium due to the release of progesterone from the corpus luteum, which causes tortuosity and distension of glands with mucin. And the endometrium may then measure up to 14 millimeters before menstruation. Moving on to the perimenopause, as we mentioned, in patients with unopposed estrogen stimulation, there also may be increased echogenicity of the endometrium with thickening that can actually be greater than about 14 millimeters. Uh, and when we see this kind of thickness, as we do here, this cannot be differentiated from true hyperplasia. Uh, in the early postmenopause, um, this is considered within five years of the last menstrual period. There still may be occasional follicular development with subsequent ovulation, 
and this is uh, resulting in uh, changes of uh, the endometrium and menstruation. And in the postmenopausal female, I just also wanted to uh, mention quickly um, that we may see thin-walled simple cysts, uh, and uh, these could represent follicles, paraovarian or paratubal cysts, ovarian surface epithelial inclusion cysts, or cyst adenomas. And in generally, these cysts are benign. And it is considered that simple cysts that are less than one centimeter uh, are almost certainly benign and clinically unimportant. An example of several different simple appearing cysts within a postmenopausal ovary. So let's move on now to other techniques for imaging the female pelvis. As I mentioned briefly, we can perform 3D reconstructions of the uterus in the coronal plane. And since 2D imaging is limited um, by the constraints of the, uh, the vaginal probe, as far as the, the way you can slice through the uterus, using volume imaging, we can routinely see the coronal plane, which cannot be seen routinely using 2D imaging. So here we can see a very nice, normal, reconstructed image uh, in the coronal plane um, of the uterus. So how do we perform these? A 3D volume is obtained through the uterus using an automated or manual sweep in the sagittal plane. It's then reconstructed in the coronal plane. And this may also include a surface rendered image, which is a thicker slice uh, type of image using shading and lighting effects. Um, and once we do our um, 3D sweep through the uh, acquisition plane, the sagittal plane, um, a multi-format display, as we see here, will appear where we also have uh, the transverse view demonstrated, the coronal view in this quadrant, and then the fourth quadrant uh, is used for the surface rendered view. And then we can take this image in uh, the coronal plane, rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, and we have uh, the image of the uterus in the coronal plane the way we like to um, look at it uh, with the fundus on top. So uterine anomalies, IUD location, and other abnormalities associated with the endometrial cavity can be better evaluated in the coronal plane uh, because um, there are findings um, that are not appreciated on traditional views. Now, the earliest use for the 3D reconstructions was in the evaluation of uterine anomalies. And as you can see here, we can nicely demonstrate a septate uterus in the coronal plane, and we would not be able to demonstrate um, this diagnostically um, using 2D imaging. And then here we can see in the coronal plane an IUD normally located within the endometrial cavity, the arms within the fundal cavity, the shaft within the mid and upper cavity. So here the entire IUD can be demonstrated on a single image, whereas using 2D imaging, this is not possible. Another technique we have is saline sonohysterography, which is installation of saline within the endometrial cavity through a balloon catheter, which allows for evaluation of associated endometrial and myometrial processes. The most common indication is abnormal bleeding although other indications include suspected congenital anomalies, suspected uterine cavity synechiae, further evaluation of suspected abnormalities seen on transvaginal imaging, and, and inadequate imaging of the endometrium on transvaginal sonography. So here we can see the fluid distended normal cavity using saline sonohysterography, or what we call an SHG. 
and we can actually um, uh, reconstruct these images in the coronal plane as well uh, to show the distended cavity uh, very nicely. Uh, this can be very helpful in evaluating intracavitary abnormalities um, using uh, a saline sonohistogram in the coronal as well as uh, the sagittal and transverse planes. So one more technique I'd like to mention is uh, contrast agents. This is microbubble contrast material that can be used to enhance the microvascular uh, circulation. And although there's little support for using it for the indication of uh, evaluation of the pelvis, a few studies suggest usefulness in differentiation of benign versus malignant ovarian masses. So here we can see pre and post contrast images of the normal ovary here and here. An enhancement of veins surrounding the ovary here can be seen, um, but the ovary itself does not really enhance very much. As opposed to an ovary that contains a, a neoplastic process, as we see here, there is marked enhancement over here um, of ovarian neoplasia. So here's just a comparison of a normal ovary there, where there is no contrast enhancement and a contrast enhanced ovary uh, containing carcinoma. And also I just wanted to mention that there can be contrast enhancement of the normal myometrium. So here we can see um, the uterus without contrast and then the increased echogenicity within the myometrium after um, the contrast is administered. So then we have a couple other imaging modalities that we should mention, MRI and CT. And first, I'd just like to emphasize once again that sonography is the initial exam of choice for evaluation of the pelvis. But computed tomography is used frequently in patients who are suspected of GI or GU abnormalities. Uh, and here we have an example of a CT where we can see the uterus with actually some enhancement normally of the myometrium, just like with contrast enhanced ultrasound. And we can see ovaries on either side of the uterus. And we can also reconstruct this in the coronal plane to show, show the, showing the uterus and the bladder. But you can see here that the detail of the organs using CT is really um, quite limited compared to the more uh, deep, nicer architecture that we have um, when we use uh, sonography. So, and then there's MRI, and this can be used as a problem-solving technique in the pelvis when ultrasound is not definitive. Uh, and pelvic anatomy can be better defined with MRI than CT. So, um, the, the anatomy is also best defined using T2 weighted images on MRI. So here we see a sagittal T2 weighted image, the uterus, where we have a very high intensity endometrium and fairly high intensity myometrium, which is normal. A uh, transverse T2 weighted image showing the uterus and we can see the endometrium in the coronal plane and just like with ultrasound, we can see a junctional zone, a hypo-intense area that hugs the periphery of the endometrium. And then looking in the adnexa, the ovaries, we can demonstrate ovaries very clearly and see the hyper-intense follicles because there's fluid within the uh, follicles that are hyper-intense. And uh, then once again, here is the coronal view of the uterus with the junctional zone, hypo-intense junctional zones, separating the increased uh, intensity of the endometrium um, from the increased intensity of the myometrium. <laughs> 
So in conclusion, using transabdominal, transvaginal, and color Doppler sonography, the architecture of the female pelvic organs is well demonstrated. One should be familiar with the normal pelvic findings, including the cyclic changes of the uterus and ovaries in order to differentiate these from true abnormalities. And newer sonographic techniques like sonohistorography and 3D of the pelvis, as well as other radiologic modalities, uh, can also play a role in pelvic evaluation.